Windows Communication Foundation. In many ways, much like WPF was trying to provide unity to a bunch of diverse APIs, WCF is trying to do the exact same thing. Because when you look at the current state of affairs, we have, with .NET 2.0, dozens of different ways to build a distributed system. We got web services. We got .NET remoting. We got named pipes. We have other forms of inter-process communication. We have ways to work with um, DCOM. Right? We have MSMQ. We have COM+. And they're all totally different. So if you're going down a certain road and you say, well, we're going to build this application using the .NET remoting layer. Four months later, you realize, oh, crap. Uh, I got to expose this thing through HTTP because that client is using Java. You got to go restructure your code base, right? Because the .NET remoting layer is pretty well geared for in-house .NET to .NET programs. Web services are better suited for a very wide exposure, OK? So what WCF says is we will provide for you a single extendable object model. And through config files, you can declaratively and dynamically totally change the underlying plumbing. Right? So let's say today you did decide, you know, we're doing an in-house program. I want to use a TCP binding to get the best performance because I know everyone's a .NET program. I don't care about web services. I just want to move this data over here. Well, then you can build up a config file that says use the net TCP binding. A couple days later, no, that's not going to work anymore. I have to use a web service binding. Literally, just change the config file and rerun your program. OK? So this is a pretty compelling model. And the way that we're able to get this great level of flexibility is we need to go ahead and look at this little handy acronym called the ABCs of WCF, addresses, bindings, and contracts. Right? The way that it's going to work is like this. When you are building a service library, you will be applying WCF attributes on your interfaces and on your classes to build things called data contracts and service contracts. And typically, all that functionality is going to be packaged up into a nice little .NET DLL. Right? So whenever you're going to build a WCF program, you typically have three assemblies. A DLL that has the actual functionality you're trying to expose. Right? Then you have another assembly, which is going to be your host. And there are a variety of hosts for a WCF service. It could be your own custom application. It could be IIS. Or it could be a Vista-specific thing called WAS, right? the Windows Activation Server. And then the third assembly, of course, would be the client. So let's kind of see how we could build up an application with these three different assemblies working together. And remember the big benefit here, right? Even though the code is going to be kind of standard-looking code, which will look very familiar if you've already done web services or remoting, the benefit that we get with WCF is that you know, just by tweaking config files, we can radically change the underlying plumbing to get the best performance and the widest available usage of our service. And all the goings on in the background, if you don't care about customizing stuff, out of sight, out of mind. You know, your one little service contract, it might be exposed in a you know, fairly untyped way through like, you know, a web service interface. Or it might be using strong typing through like, you know, a binary formatter. Okay, those underlying plumbing pieces just kind of happen naturally in the background. So you kind of get the idea of what WCF is trying to do. Unified model, which allows us to really change those endpoints in a very declarative manner. 